Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 128, Sherlockian Coin Collecting. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a chronic huh? In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Your Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the Baker Street Irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Cha-ching! Well, that's the sound. <laughs> you know, we're, we're so cheap here. How cheap? We're so cheap. We don't. We don't even use sound effects. That is the sound <laughs> of money making. And you know, the money maker here is simply having you with us as a listener here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees, where it's always eighteen ninety five. I'm Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Wolder. And boy, woo, 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 wind up that change machine because you're in for it this time around. Um, you know, Bert, we've, we've talked about collecting and, and coins and, and, and money before on this show. Money. Money makes the world go around, the world go around, the world go around. Money makes the world go around, it makes the world go around. As a matter of fact, it wasn't too long ago. It may have been over on uh, Trifles where you talked about <laughs> your grandmother and how she got into your uncle's coin collection. Was that? Well, no, that's right. My father and I visited uh, his mom uh, towards the end of her life and uh, were asking her how she was getting on. And she was getting her groceries delivered from the local supermarket. And she told us that every time – the delivery person came. She reached into this cardboard box and gave him a token. And we said, what token? And we, we found out she, she was uh, dispensing things she didn't understand from somebody's long ago coin collection. And the oldest coin in that box was a silver denarius from the, from the reign of Sextus Pompey. I later <laughs> found out by getting it uh, evaluated by a collector. So she was giving away. Old coins so to he, delivery people. He got a few denarii. Uh, she sacrificed a pigeon and, uh, <laughs> and, and had some ram's blood ready for him, right? I guess so. Wow. Yeah. So where, where would your grandmother have come across such a collection? Oh, it must have belonged to some forgotten family member, some, uh, aunt or uncle or other member of the family. I'm pretty sure my grandfather was not a coin collector. My father became a coin collector, but only because I did. When I was little, as I think we mentioned when we talked with Greg Ruby, I began a preliminary, a sort of an early coin collection from those days because I was fascinated by coins. But um, So somewhere along the line, some member of the family had acquired a coin collection and it wound up uh, in an unknown shoebox somewhere, hmm. and there it went. <laughs> Yes, well, no, not all of it. I mean, we did, we did manage to hang on to what was left. Yeah, well, well, you know, folks, if you've managed to hang on to some of your change still, uh, why don't you fork it over to us? Um, we, we don't ask for a lot, quite frankly. Uh, you can become a patron of the arts here at I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere simply by clicking on the donate button to PayPal. Uh, or the orange button that takes you over to Patreon, which is simply a subscription service. It means for every episode that we put out, we simply charge you a nominal fee. The beauty of that is you get to pick the fee, and you don't get charged unless we are producing. 
Pretty simple. Uh, it, it's kind of how the whole economic system works. Money can be exchanged for goods and services. <laughs> so if you like the sound of that, if you like the sound of our voices, uh, just drop a, drop a coin in the coin box there, so to speak, virtually to help us keep the lights on. Uh, to pay for things like email and uh, our website fees and the hosting costs. Every time there's a download of this episode, it costs us. So the more popular we are, the more poor we are, unfortunately. I don't know how that works. But if you'd like to try that out, we would love to have you. And we do have a number of people who are doing that already, and we do appreciate that, every single one of them. You could also do us the favor of recommending us by a rating or review on the podcast player or platform of your choice. So get on over to IHearOfSherlock.com and let us know how we have affected your life. Yes, yes, or go to Facebook.com slash IHearOfSherlock, IHearOfSherlock.tumblr, we're even still on Tumblr.com, Twitter.com slash IHearOfSherlock, all of those places and many, many more are waiting for your commentary. And by the way, when we ask you for funding, friends, don't think that this is just another capitalistic endeavor. Because what we've really done is divided our show into small bits of ownership, and we call them episodes. And so you're actually becoming an owner, because we believe that the workers should control the means of production here at I Hear of Sherlock. And that's why we're giving you this rare opportunity. And all you have to do is your part. If you care to do <laughs> If you care to do your part, for our friends at Wes Express, here's how you do it. In the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex, we're looking forward to the 29th of September and Michaelmas, when the harvest will be over and we hold our hiring fairs, because we're still coping with the labor shortage from the Black Death. But you don't need to pay high wages to your field workers because they want to read your copy of One Fixed Point in a Changing Age, a new generation on Sherlock Holmes, from our Wessex Press. These essays by a new generation of enthusiasts, many of whom are young or female or both, embrace modern-day revelations of Sherlock Holmes with an introduction by Laurie R. King. Departing summer hath assumed an aspect, tenderly illumined, the gentlest look of spring that calls from yonder leafy shade a timely caroling. As the season shifts, reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press provides. Choose yours today. Ah, you know, I, I never tire of the of the bucolic assault to the senses <laughs> that is Wessex. Well, you know, part of the reason that they're doing so well over there is they only drink beer uh, because, mm. of course, the streams and rivers in the ancient ancestral kingdom of Wessex uh, are not really safe to drink unless they've been boiled or processed it's, in yeah, some way. It's the smart thing to do. And it makes breakfast a lot of fun over there. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, Cocoa Puffs and beer is the breakfast of ex-champions. <laughs> so, I swear by it. Well, uh, we have a fascinating guest this time around. And you know what, Bert? I am going to let you do the introduction because uh, you've had quite an association with him and uh, know him from uh, the eastern seaboard there. So yes, go for well, it. Well, happy to do that. Greg Ruby. Uh, a lifelong Baltimorean, uh, began collecting coins in 1976, the same year that he read his first Sherlock Holmes story, which you will shortly hear about. He's a graduate of the University of Baltimore, a certified meeting professional and association management consultant. His collecting specialties are Maryland numismatics and U.S. military payment certificates, He's the founder and first executive director of the Baltimore Area Numismatic Coalition. And he's also served on the boards of the Maryland State Numismatic Association and the Token and Medal Society. He's an award-winning exhibitor. He's been honored with an ANA Presidential Award and is a member of the Numismatic Literary Guild. In the world of Sherlock Holmes, 
Greg is a member of the Bootmakers of Toronto, the Denizens of the Bar of Gold, the Diogenes Club of Washington, the Epilogues of Sherlock Holmes, the John H. Watson Society, the Red Circle of Washington, the Sherlock Holmes Society of London, the White Rose Irregulars, and he's a master copper beachsmith of the Sons of the Copper Beaches. He's the current commissioner of the Six Napoleons of Baltimore, and he is the founder of the Sherlockians of Baltimore, also known as the SOBs. Uh, so it's a wonderful opportunity to welcome Greg Ruby to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. This is such a great subject. You know, one of the things we've been meaning to do is get you on the show because your specialty is an area of Sherlockian enthusiasm that I suspect touches a lot of people who hasn't at one point in their lives been a coin collector. How did uh, you get into this? What was your start in coin collecting? Well, once a year, my father would um, borrow my piggy bank, dump all the coins out, and look for the old wheat bets, wheat back cents. Um, if you remember, the, a lot of the pennies used to have wheat ears on the back prior to 1959. Our deal was he could have those, but nothing else. I would watch him like a hawk while he was going through my piggy bank, <laughs> and we um, we came across a buffalo nickel. He wanted that. I'm going. That wasn't part of our deal, and from there, I started collecting coins. Now, were you carefully watching him, and did he replace those wheat cents with real pennies, or did he just sort of glom off with them and leave you penniless? He replaced them. So he, w- so he wasn't you- entirely disreputable. No, 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 no. He, um, <laughs> so, so from that, can I infer that he was a coin collector? He was an accumulator. He never actively collected by having an organization, but he supported me in the hobby. What did he do with the wheat cents? Uh, he f- put them into a little jug that he had on his nightstand. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then he, at five at a time, Bert, he exchanged them for buffalo nickels. Buffalo <laughs> nickels. And, and then Liberty Dimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a vicious circle. So when you grew up, were you one of those kids, cause I was, who had the blue Whitman cardboard binders and you were trying to get a complete run of pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters and things? Exactly. I had every one of those folders, and I was trying to collect everything and anything. And did you get all the way through? Did you did you fill up those Whitman boards? Do you still oh, have? Oh no, I I still have the coins. I don't have the boards anymore. Do they even still do that for kids today? Oh, definitely. You can still find them in some hobby shops. So, what do you collect? I don't actively collect coins that much anymore. Um, about five years ago, I became involved with a numismatic group working their convention, and I thought I'd become active again in the hobby. So I thought, you know, ha- find some coins that have a connection to Sherlock Holmes. So, and that's what I've been doing since. So, like like Sherlock Holmes, does the joy of coin collecting increase by some magnitude by associating with other people who share the same hobby? The conversations I have with fellow collectors are probably the best part of the whole thing. Mm. Although I have to do say when I see a new item that I'm not aware of, there is a mad rush. <laughs> so so you will trample over each other to get to it? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's marvelous. So, and so, what's it what's an example of a new item? Um, well, back in May when the Speckled Band had their annual meeting, they came out with a souvenir. That was a replica coin of Charles I. Oh, right. And they have done – well, we'll get to that in a little bit, but uh, you know, we'll talk eventually about things the various societies have done. So did you get a hold of your Charles I coin? Not yet. I keep putting it off. <laughs> Why? Because you want to have something to look forward to? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, you, you tick off every item on your bucket list and what's left. I mean – you got to kick the bucket at that point, so that's not. Or just get a bigger bucket. Well, there you go, there you go. So, so when did you first discover that there were numismatic societies out there beyond just these uh, these blue boards? Uh, I was in the late 1970s um, at the local hobby shop where I was going to buy my copy of the weekly newspaper Coin World. There was a little flyer there for a club that was having a meeting the following week. And Dad took me there. I was 12 at the time. And it was um, to take up the next 20 to 30 years of my life going to coin clubs. And, and do, they, yeah. do they vary 
uh, regionally? I mean, like, we know there are different setups for different Sherlockian societies, but what about, what about numismatic societies? Um, they, they vary. Um, most of your local ones meet once or maybe twice a month. Um, there'd be some, a business meeting. There would be a program, something related to coin collecting, maybe an auction. You would have more serious groups located in your larger cities. Um, that would give more scholarly presentations and maybe sponsor a coin show. Um, then you would have state organizations, regional organizations, and above that, specialty collect, specialty groups. What's an um, example of a specialty group, group? There was a group at one time that collected Jefferson Nichols by the number of steps you could see on Monticello on the back of the nickel. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is highly specialized. It is. Wow. And I thought Sherlockians were a, a fickle group. Well, you know, it's funny you think about book collecting and it's parallels to coin collecting. So in book collecting, it's a first edition. It's a first edition with a misprint. It's a first edition with a dust jacket. The dust jacket's in very good condition. The book is in good condition. You know, you have all these variables, but the number of steps on Monticello. Wow. Well, and then in coin collecting, you know, as I remember, you could also collect coins based on the mint in which they were struck. I imagine that's still true today. The Philadelphia coins are marked Philadelphia and so on. Mm -hmm. With a P, D for Denver, S for San Francisco here in the States. Um, There's many ways to collect. You can do – I do a lifetime collection. I'm trying to get one design of every coin that was struck in my lifetime. It's become a little bit more challenging in the last couple of years when you come out with five new quarter designs every year. Um, with the state, the statehood quarters and the national park series. This yeah. makes it more of a challenge. And is it just and coins in any condition or do you collect on circulated coins or proof coins or things like that? For the ones, for the modern issues, I try to collect them in uncirculated. Although I will for admit, I enjoy the coins that have been circulated. There's a, some history to it, some feel that, you know, these have actually been used. Now, are you, are you able to take any historical coin that's been circulated and uh, you know, draw some inferences from it the way Sherlock Holmes might from a, a piece of evidence? Occasionally, um, it dep- all depends on the area that you collect. There's um, an area called Civil War Tokens when um, pocket change was very hard to find during the Civil War. Some enterprising merchants struck their own tokens, sort of look like an Indian head sense. Fascinating history with them, and you can actually, you know, picture how they were used or in what area. Hmm. That's fascinating. Now, you know, you mentioned uh, the various mints and their their, uh, their their marks on coins. Uh, what do numismaticians generally think of the Franklin Mint? <laughs> ah, we were generally glad that the Franklin Mint forgot about Sherlock Holmes. Um, <laughs> um, the Franklin Mint produced a large number of items. They marketed them, them very well. I think there are people still waiting to get their money back on some of the items. Well, speaking of money back guarantees, that, that brings us to Sherlock Holmes. And we all know that, you know, for folks here, and I hear, hear of Sherlock everywhere, uh, we guarantee your money back on every episode. Um, <laughs> but how did you first uh, come to discover this, this fellow known as Sherlock Holmes, Greg? I, I owe it to a fifth grade reading class. We were forced to read the adventure of the three Garadubs. Oh my goodness. Of all stories <laughs> in the fifth grade reading, they did Garadubs? That was a story that was in the reader and it was also around the same time I discovered coin collecting. So, uh, I thought it was a match made in heaven. <laughs> wow. Wow. And that's, that's amazing that after being subjected to the three Garadubs that you would, um, uh, well, it could have been worse. It could have been three gables, but uh, that, that after the three Garadibs, you would continue through the rest of the canon. Well, my next one was the Red Headed League, so that might have had something to do with it as well. Oh, yeah, that would. That makes sense then. That makes. Sense. Well, what did you do? You remember what you made of of the story? Do Do you remember? Did actually the character of Garadib? Did he make an impression on you? The idea of somebody surrounded by all of these articles and and uh, things um, that you'd collect. Not really. Um, I was more entranced by Sherlock and Watson, especially at the scene at the end after Watson had been grazed by the bullet. Yeah, well, that's the best part of that story. And so that was when you first learned about Sherlock Holmes. And did you? And and as you say, did you then go on and read the rest of the canon? We did. Um, 
my parents used to participate in some craft shows that were in a local mall. And while they were out setting up their booth, I would always go into the local, um, the Walden bookstore and peruse there. And they had the, um, illustrated Sherlock Holmes in their bargain bin. Um, so I wound up buying it and fell in love with all the stories. Yeah. And what were they doing in craft shows? Uh, my mother used to make stained glass ornaments. Oh, wow. And his father was on the hunt for wheat pennies. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> your father was making change and your mother was making ornaments. <laughs> very true. Uh, well, that's fascinating. Yeah. So, obviously, outside of the three Garadebs, there are other instances of money in the canon. And when, when you think of, of the time that you, you know, perused the canon for the first time and you came across these references to uh, w- whether it was change someone was making, whether it was an object that was being searched for or, um, or, or um, exchanged. What are some of the significant uh, pieces of canonical coinage that uh, you can think of? Uh, probably the most common from the stories would be the shilling. Um, you know, it's what the Baker Street regulars pay their members. You know, that was the daily wages for um, Wiggins and the crew. A very famous um, one. And, and that's the award that all irregulars get when they're invested into the organization, too. So mm-hmm. highly appropriate. Um, you have a Watson stipend from the original story of stu- Study in Star- Scarlet. Uh, it was 11 shillings, 6 pence, I believe. Wow. And how much does that work out to approximately today? Not a lot of money. <laughs> um, although everything's relative. True. I'm but, trying to do the, the exchange rate in my head right now. Of course, it's not working out. But, I mean, if Kind Doyle was paid 25 shillings for his first story, hmm. and that would allow you to stay in a hotel in London for a couple of days at least. So it's not a bad, bad sum of money. Well, Watson blew, I, blew through it pretty quickly too, right? <laughs> yeah. So when so when you think about the canon, what else is there? Is there is there in your mind a great uh, canonical coin? You know, we just talked a minute ago about the coins of Charles the First. Anything loom large for you? What about Irene Adler's gold sovereign that she gave? The gold she, sovereign that she um, gave to witness the wedding and scandal in Bohemia. Um, there was also half a sovereign to the coachman. In that same story, hmm. um, the sovereign's a beautiful coin. I mean, Saint George slaying the dragon. Um, it's one of my favorites. And have you have you added one of these to your collection? I do have one in my collection, and you'd be surprised at the date. Ah, oh, is it eighteen ninety five? It is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So you have an eighteen ninety five gold sovereign? Yes. Wow, that's that's real money. I was reading. Um, one of the Dorothy Sayers mysteries have his carcass in which the murder victim is found with a money belt with 300 pounds in gold, gold sovereigns um, included in it. And uh, that was when England was still on the gold standard, which I gather they went off in the 1930s or something like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, those were the days when uh, an, ounce, <laughs> an ounce of gold was an ounce of gold. Very true. Yeah. Jeez. Big money. Now, was, was a half sovereign an actual coin or was it simply uh, an amount of money? Uh, it's an actual coin as well. Okay. Okay. So instead of being worth 20 shillings, it was worth 10 shillings. I've got it. So, you know, Bert, that, uh, that reference to have his carcass, fascinating one. And when you think 300 pounds of gold, um, that, that's enough to weigh you down a little bit. <laughs> And, it's one uh, of the reasons why, yes, why the body didn't turn up sooner in the story. I thought Dorothy Lee Sayers was very clever about that. Well, exactly. And we had a case where someone was trying to hide something by weighing it down with coins as well in one of the stories, didn't we? Oh, yeah, sure. Twisted lip. Yeah. Pennies and half pennies. Q Boone and his little, uh, little uh, bag of, uh, uh, of winnings from winnings from his uh, well, actually compensation from his so-called job of being a beggar. Yeah. That's fascinating. So if you could pick one coin, well, I mean, we've talked about a bunch of coins. I mean, other than the Irene Adler gold sovereign, 
What what else is in your personal collection? I assume you've picked up a shilling or two. What uh, do you have anything else that has a canonical link to it? I've tried to collect one of every coin that's been mentioned in the ca- in the canon. So that'd be your half penny and your penny for the two bronze coins. Um, six pence, shilling, florin. Florin is two shillings. Uh, half crown and crown. And this is probably a good good time to point out that on your Scion's website, you know, we haven't really talked about the Scion, the fourth Garadeb, which you can find at fourthgaradeb.com. Among other things, you've had uh, postings there where you explain the coinage of the Victorian age and how these things all fit together. Hey, pennies and pennies and florins and so on. Yes. So do you my, fa- fav- my favorite is the one that explains how everything relates since you, I'm used to, and most of your listeners, you know, one penny times a hundred equals one dollar. However, to equal one shilling, it's twelve pennies. Twenty shillings equal one pound. So you need 240 pennies to equal one pound. Yeah, and then and then a lot of people don't understand, you know, the connection between guineas and pounds, the difference there. Mm-hmm. Guinea is worth more than a pound. Um, a pound is 20 shillings. A guinea is 21 shillings. Now, is there a separate coin for a guinea? There was a separate coin for the guinea, but none were made during Victoria's reign. Uh, the last one was done during King George. Hmm. Hmm. I did Really? George that. George the first, you mean? Or George? Uh, George the third. Wow. Or maybe even the fifth. I'm not. 1818. Oh, well, that wouldn't be George V. George V, I think, was Elizabeth's father. Uh, the, the term mostly hung on into um, horse racing. Oh, uh, really? Mm hmm. Because the prizes were in guineas? Yes. Well, uh, if you won, right? Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Are there, as you've looked at the canon, uh, you know, sometimes we see inconsistencies in Watson's writings. Have you picked up any inconsistencies about coinage in the canon? Um, thinking, thinking about things like the engineer's thumb and, uh, other in the, engine, in the engineer's thumb, there's, there's no discrepancies to the coinage. The, the coining press that they were using in the engineer's thumb seems overly large to me, but otherwise, I can't find any inconsistencies in any of the other stories related to money. Now, were things like hydraulic presses used in uh, coining back in the 1890s? Yes. Um, I want to say it was around 1830s it started becoming more prevalent. And as the technology got better, it just became more and more commonplace. Are there any other inconsistencies about coins? I mean, do you think that um, the coins found as part of the Musgrave case really were – as described, does that make sense to think of them as coins of Charles the First? I was confused at first because they mentioned the coins are tarnished, and generally mm. gold is not tarnished. Right. right. So I'm thinking they were mostly silver, but that's the only thing I would be able to find. Yeah, they were. Let's see. the The description was, uh, you know, the box was was furred outside by a thick layer of dust and damp, and worms had eaten through the wood so that a crop of livid fungi was growing on the inside. Several discs of metal, old coins apparently, uh, such as I hold here, were scattered over the bottom, uh, but it contained nothing else. So they were, they were discernible enough as, as pieces of metal at least, but uh, mm-hmm. they were in a rough state. Now, were, were coins of, of Charles the first time, were those minted in... Uh, precious metals? Yes. They were. Okay. So, a um, little, little spit and polish would have cleaned them right up then, huh? Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or you could done like Nathan Garadev and have a chamois and, you know, polish them up. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, man, the man was prepared for anything. That's good. That's, that's, that's fascinating. So, I, I wanted to, to share something with you. I, you, you probably know of this set, uh, and I don't know at this point, I don't know who minted them, but you can probably tell me. I have a set of Sherlock Holmes coins. Uh, it's a set of, let's see, two, four, six, eight coins. Um, mm-hmm. from the 100th anniversary of, uh, the return of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? I exactly, I do. Um, they were made in 1994 by the Pop Joy Mint. The Pop Joy Mint is located in the Isle of Man. 
and these coins were struck for the nation of Gibraltar. Hmm. Um, there's actually – you have eight different designs, and they were struck in three different metals, copper, nickel, silver, and gold. So in theory, there are 24 coins to collect. Ah, I didn't know that. Well, I presume you have the gold gold ones. I have never seen one of the gold ones. <laughs> Ooh. That's probably because Scott has them all. No, no, no. Now, it's interesting to me because there were 5,000 of each design made in gold. So that, oh, there's 40,000 of them out there to be seen. And in four years of looking, I have not even seen a photograph of one. <laughs> wow. Now, that's amazing. So, so either they were, uh, they were minted and simply, uh, left unsold to a certain degree. Uh, or they are in serious collector's hands who do not wish to part with them, uh, or they've been lost and forgotten. Is it, is it's, it's fascinating to me because um, they also did a series of gold coins that year featuring Pekingese, Pekingese dogs, well, and I can course. find one of those gold coins every day on eBay. <laughs> You're kidding. I guess Pekingese owners are not as... Uh, Connected with their collectibles as Sherlockians. I would agree with you on that. <laughs> oh, that's so, that's so funny. I mean, Woodhouse, you know, was a great fancier of Pekingese dogs. I bet, uh, had he lived through the past the 1970s, he might have been interested in them. <laughs> that's a good well, that's point. amazing. Yeah. So what other, what other Sherlockian special coinage has there been over the years? Um, the country of Tuvalu in the South Pacific has done two Sherlock coins. Uh, one featuring the Gloria Scott. And um, there's another one. They did another series, um, Heroes and Villains. It's a coin featuring Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty. Have there been is, – is is Holmes unique in this or, or are these same mints, these same countries popping out coins of Dracula and Clark Gable and Tarzan and uh, Tantan and – most of these other countries are popping coins out as fast as they can produce, produce them. It might be their leading economic product. <laughs> and are there noted designers? Who's who are the uh, did the designers feature in this? I mean, I remember from well, of course, from our explorations of Tate McKenzie's uh, archives and looking for that three hours for lunch club medal. You know, I remember what I learned about Tate McKenzie, who was. Uh, a, an instructor at the University of Pennsylvania, but also a noted medalist and artist and quite an interesting guy in his own right. And I remember from my own coin collecting days, the designer of the, of the walking liberty dollar and so on as being noted artists. But who's, who's designing these things today? Is Medallic Art still, uh, the Medallic taught? Art Company is still in business, but, um, most of these designs are done by staff engravers at whatever mint is making them. Most of the time, their monograph is not even on the coins anymore, hmm. unfortunately. That kind of – that cuts down on uh, discovery in the future, if, you know, if this, this story has been lost at some point. Exactly. Hmm. That's too bad. I want to I talk a little bit about R. Tate McKenzie because um, th this, this is a, a fascinating uh, metal. Uh, this – well, well, why don't you first tell us uh, what the metal is and how it was discovered? At the meeting of the Grill Parser Club of the Hoboken Free State, I want to say this was two years ago, Bert. Uh, yeah, we were we we were in Philadelphia in June of fifteen, so that was that was two years ago. So okay, we, maybe it was the May meeting because I think Terry had a meeting yes. in May of that year. Yeah. Um, Steve Rothman, the editor of the Baker Street Journal, was showing me this lapel pin that um, Bert had designed for the Three Hours for Lunch Club. And he's going, have you ever seen the metal of this? My ears perk up um, and do some research. And supposedly the metal was at the archives of the um, University of Pennsylvania. We make arrangements to go there. Um, we discover that the, there is a picture of the metal – in an early issue of the Saturday Review of Literature hmm. in the column by um, Christopher Morley. He's going to the Three Hours for Lunch Club, now has a medal, has a picture of it. Um, and that led us to the archives at, at Penn. And unfortunately, they don't have the medal in their archives, but they have a plaster galvano about 
six inches in diameter, and it's only the one side of the metal, the the seal of the club. Yeah, you might explain what a galvano is. A galvano is when they're making the design of a coin, they do it on a much larger scale. Imagine something about the size of a dinner plate, or if you want to go with a three Garrett reference, the size of a soup plate. <laughs> uh, and they would take, they would do the design on this much larger scale, and then they would have some equipment that would trace over the larger galvano and reduce it down to the size of the die that would actually strike the coin or the metal, a reducing machine. Yeah, but the original metal was was usually done in clay at at or at or around that size, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, it would fascinating. be. It would, it would be done in the larger size and then continually reduced down in size. Yeah, Tate McKenzie was an interesting fellow. He was a Canadian. He was a physician. He was a sculptor. He was a soldier. Among the works of his that people might remember, if anyone was involved in Boy Scouting. One of his particular notable works is the Ideal Scout. He did a a figure of an ideal Boy Scout. And somewhere along the line, he became part of Christopher Morley's Three Hours for Lunch Club group. And in 1926, he uh, created a medal for the group, which which basically shows – the uh, sun over the yard arm and the sun is sort of sort of looks like christopher morley and the flag of the hoboken free state is is waving from the yard arm of this mast of a, of a boat and on that is the symbol of the three hours for lunch club at the time which was basically three beer steins <laughs> and um he produced this medal and morley featured it in one of his Saturday review columns from the Bowling Green, a photograph of the medal of the three hours for lunch club. But whether or not there was actually ever one struck in metal and what became of it is uh, something we haven't determined. It is a mystery. There is one collector out there when I wrote the article about this on, our, on my site. Uh, he believes he saw one in an eBay listing years ago, but did not provide any other details. Hmm. I'm of the opinion it doesn't actually exist yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I like that. <laughs> well, that's right. You were talking uh, some time ago about striking uh, sort of a reproduction of that uh, design as part of the fourth Garadev activity. It's still on my bucket list of things to do. I just haven't quite gotten the design to a point where I like it yet. Uh, the designers that have worked with it are having difficulty um, recreating the lettering on the metal. Yeah, that's the toughest part. There was some the, the metal featured Latin of some sort, but actually the the Latin scholars that I've shown that to uh failed to parse it. The general gist of it is that uh it's supposed to say I think three hours are not enough for lunch or three hours are just right for lunch or something like that. But it mm-hmm. doesn't really doesn't really scan. Yeah. The the problem is the metal was done by hand and they're looking to just use some type of font and do it by computer. Computer design. So tell us a little bit about the fourth Garadeb. How did um, the fourth Garadeb predates your visit to the University of Penn Archives and the Tate McKenzie search, but not by much. Didn't uh, the fourth Garadeb sort of start uh, three years ago? We started in August of um, 2014. Uh, we had our first meeting at the World's Fair of Money, the annual convention of the American Numismatic Association that was held in the suburbs of Chicago, Illinois. The group, the idea for the group actually started 20 years earlier. There was a gentleman, Ed Rashad. He was the longtime executive director of the American Numismatic Association. He was asking me about a token that a group that I belonged to had issued, and we had a Sherlock caricature on it, and he was trying to get one for his collection. This was back in 94. And he was talking about he was going to form a Sherlockian coin club. Uh, unfortunately, we were both busy people and nothing happened at the time. Um, he was busy with the association. I was busy with my career. So nothing happened until late 2013. I decided to break my ankle severely and spend the next five months in bed. Clever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, thankfully, about two weeks before I had my accident, I rearranged the bookshelf. The only books I could reach while I was in bed were my Sherlock Holmes books. If, if this had happened two weeks earlier, we would be talking about Tom Clancy right now. Oh, please. <laughs> uh, 
So um, it was during that time where I was reading the stories in bed. I remember the conversations with Ed. I um, set out a few feelers. There's a fellow um, coin collector by the name of Bob Fritch. Bob Fritch. I think you might know him, Scott. I do, from Cox and Company of New England. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, he had put out a Sherlockian wooden nickel a few years earlier, so I wrote to him going, what do you think of this idea? <laughs> Uh, he thought it was a good idea, and we went ahead and formed the club in August of 2014. Started the website shortly after that. We now have Garadelbs. We have um, 75 Garadelbs in five different countries right now. Wow. And what, what are the qualifications for membership? Um, you submit an application. We have a lifetime fee of $22.10, <laughs> a bad play on 221B, <laughs> and um, – we give you a membership certificate and our version of the Garadev Decadracum, the very coin that Nathan Garadev was polishing in the story. Ooh. It's our homage to the BSI shilling. And we ask that you choose some investiture name from one of the 60 stories. I like uh, that. We're not that discriminating. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we I- have Bert as a member to show you. <laughs> no, you'll take anybody. So, and I think your your investiture uh, with the fourth Garabid, Garadeb is of is the Bank of England, isn't that yes. right? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Can't beat that. Yeah. Um, the, since there was no Greg in any of the stories, I figured that I might as well go home. You know, exudes power and confidence. <laughs> so the the, um, the 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 society has seventy five members. Do you ever meet in person? We try to have a dinner meeting in conjunction with the two annual conventions of the American Numismatic Association. Okay. Uh, this year we were in Orlando and Denver. In 2018, we will have a dinner in March in Irving, Texas, and then in August, um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. So that's um, that's fascinating because uh, in that respect, it is not too dissimilar from – uh, Peter Blau's The Practical but Limited Geologists, which obviously, as the name goes, is for Sherlockians who are also geologists, and they have their meeting around the annual uh, uh, geologist uh, conventions. I don't know the, the specific names of those, but that's that's how they choose their dinners. So, very practical. We basically ripped the idea off from Mr. Blau. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um Okay. When we had our first dinner, we had it in the schedule as the fourth Garadub, and not that many people could figure it out. Hmm. Um, so we're now in the conference schedule as the numismatic friends of Sherlock Holmes. There you go. There you go. I like that. I like that. Now, the uh, the website, um, absolutely fascinating. Uh, there's so much to parse through uh, there. Um, so many stories, so many links, so many... Uh, scholarly articles, news-related things. Um, if someone came to fourthgaradeb.com for the very first time, what would you recommend them to seek out and to read on the site? Um, good question. We have an item on the menu, How to Use, which basically just says how the um, website is laid out and how you can find things. Okay. Um, and... We have a very good search function, so if you're interested in a particular story or a particular item, just type in that phrase and l- go explore. Excellent. And it, it's we, uh, it's set up like a like a blog, so there are certain categories with, with uh, tags, so to speak, that you can uh, look through the tag cloud, I suppose, and find things uh, that way as well. Very true. We try to focus on one story a month, like this month we're doing the Red Headed League. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll have some stories about – some articles about the stories themselves, and then we'll try to find some numismatic items that relate to the stories as well. Do you encourage uh, readers or visitors to the site to uh, do any kind of show and tell? That, you know, If they found a, uh, a coin that they've never seen before, that they're particularly proud of, that they have a, a, a platform to share that with the rest of the world or – uh, you, you can do it in the comments feature, although we don't allow you to post pictures. We are also on Facebook. We have a group on Facebook, and you can post there as well. Um, and then we can research the item from there. The one thing I would love to encourage more of is conversation on the stories, commenting, and get some to and fro back on that those topics. Yeah. 
Yeah, we we've, we've noticed it's uh it, it can be slightly difficult these days to to extract comments from people on the website. Uh, yes. They, they tend to have the conversation on Twitter, on Facebook, on <laughs> seemingly anywhere else but the site. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a factor of the world we live in right now, I suppose. There's one post I had there where it's, it's still been up there. I want to say it's been up there for a year, like for two years now. First person to comment will get a prize, and it's still available. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fascinating, and you've got every, everything on the site. Uh, that you might expect about coinage, Sherlock Holmes in the Victorian age, and also many things you would not expect, such as Sherlock Holmes and chocolate coins. Ah. Ooh. <laughs> Let's hear about that. This one has been driving me nuts for a few years. Someone gave me a photograph of what looks like a treasure chest. And when I was younger, especially around the time of um, Halloween, you would sometimes get these gold wrapped chocolate coins. Mm-hmm. They would look like pirate doubloons or twenty dollar gold pieces. Um, and someone sent me this picture of one. It's a treasure chest, and it's a, it looks like a chocolate Sherlock, a, a gold covered ch- chocolate coin of Sherlock Holmes. Mm. Uh, and it looks like it's from the museum at two two one B Baker Street, the gift shop. Mm. Um. We've kept looking, and just recently we came across another picture of someone, and we have proved that it is from the gift shop at the museum at 221B, and they were selling for a pound each. Hmm. Um, I just had to figure a way to get one of these. That's a pretty good moneymaker right there. Um, Yeah. So I understand, and and these may not – these particular coins themselves may not be part of it, but I do understand that when John Bennett Shaw – uh, sent his collection from, uh, New Mexico to Minnesota to make up the, uh, Sherlock Holmes collections at the Minnesota libraries, uh, that he also sent a refrigerator because he had <laughs> so many Sherlockian chocolates. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there were those coins involved, but if you're really desperate, Greg, um, we'll cover for you in the lobby while you do your subterfuge. Um, <laughs> I, we can work it like the Redheaded League, since that's one of your early uh, favorite uh, stories, uh, and 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 see if we can make that happen. We can tunnel under. Uh, I might take you up on that next time I'm up in uh, when I'm up in Minneapolis. Hey, Tim Johnson, if you're listening, heads up. Um, we we won't go about it the usual way. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so what, I'll probably never be allowed in the library again. Now. Or, or, or other places, one might imagine. So, what, what is, what are the uh, most extreme lengths that you've gone to for a collectible? Um, there's been more than a fair share of one-sided trades. Oh, uh, where I've given up multiple pieces to obtain one. Um, and when you There's, say one-sided, does that mean you come out the victor? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. come on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, probably the most prevalent area nowadays are, is challenge coins. Are, are you familiar with challenge coins at all? No. Um, they're mostly issued for military units, police units, or clubs. And the thinking is everyone who belongs to this organization would have one of these challenge coins. And let's say you you and Bert would each have one of these coins. You'd meet up at a bar somewhere. Shocking, I know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like you've Scott, been following us. <laughs> Scott would, would pull out his challenge coin and show it to Bruce. And if Bruce doesn't produce his challenge coins, Bruce has to buy the, the next drink. However, if Bruce successfully answers the challenge by showing his coin, then you, Scott, had to buy the next drink. Hmm. A very Sherlockian thing. I think we should have more of these in our in our scions. But um, there's been about 30 challenge coins issued in the last couple of years. They're modern. There's less than 100 known of these. There's been they, sometimes they go for three figures, and it's more like and they shouldn't be that much. Wow, that's impressive. Um, now, if you got two people trying to get the same item, it can bid the price up. Unfortunately, right. right. Well. You know, now that you mention this, this is fascinating. The um, the Constitution 
and bylaws of the Baker Street Irregulars uh, say that um, the current round shall be bought by any member who fails to identify by title of story and context a quotation from the sacred writing submitted by any other member. It seems to me, Greg, that you could actually create a little bit of a, 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 a contest among, you know, cat among the pigeons, as it were. Um, if you struck 60 canonical coins, canonical challenge coins, and people wanted to purchase them, and we could actually use those uh, in challenge situations at, you know, at the bar, at meetings, etc. It, it might actually be an interesting way to uh, tap into your own interest and to bring back uh, some spirit of the old bylaws. Uh, it's a great idea. It's something I would love to do someday. I know in our first year we did do a challenge coin for our group, the fourth Gara Dub. Um, usually when I surprise the other members with the challenge coin, they still don't buy me a drink. I'm very yeah. disappointed. <laughs> well, may- maybe you just have to make them out of legal tender. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. Well, the, the whole concept, though, is just uh, it, it's just wonderful. You know, I don't I don't think we see enough of that. Uh, you know, in and among uh, colleagues and uh, professionals anymore. It is an area that hasn't been covered that much. It was kind of fun to, to find that it wasn't that covered. So, really interesting. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's a great it's a great effort and. We encourage everybody to take a look at the fourth Garadim and uh, join the Sherlockian hunt, coin of the Sherlockian realm. It's a great subject. It is indeed. It is indeed. And, you know, the the one thing that you can uh, be absolutely certain of when it comes to uh, the, the hobby of coin collecting is that numismatists do not fear change. And that's why it makes perfect <laughs> sense that in the Sherlockian world, it's always 1895. Well, Greg, it's been a real treat here. Um, we've got your Facebook page. We've got your website. Uh, is there anything else uh, to which you would like to draw people's attention? Uh, first, I just want to thank you for having me. When we formed this club, one of our goals was to catalog all the known items that related to either Sherlock um, Watson, Moriarty, um, Conan Doyle. And we thought if we ever get up to 200, we'd be very lucky. Right now we're at 325 and we're still counting. Wow. That is fantastic. Well, congratulations on, um, you know, the gift that keeps on giving, you know, and I think we're, we're finding additional people out there, uh, all who have, uh, either some specific or uh, long lost love of coins. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you'd welcome uh, more as our listeners go and check your website out. Definitely. Excellent. Well, thank you, Greg. Thank you again for having me. So tell me, did you ever collect coins? I don't know that we've ever talked about this. You know, um, I did to a certain extent, and and you know, it it really gets to the heart of what you and I have talked about before, and that is uh, the collecting gene. You know, either you have the collecting gene or you don't. It's not something that you can acquire <laughs> along the way, and uh, it it typically manifests itself in a number of ways. Um, certainly, you know, we have our own. Uh, Sherlockian collections at this point. Um, but there are other things. I'm, I'm looking at uh, jars and jars of matchbooks that I've got uh, over on a shelf there that really need to be um, uh, separated and cataloged if I'm to do it properly. Uh, but coins uh, at a certain point were part of that as well. Um, you know, like, like Greg, I, I had wheat coins. I had buffalo nickels. I had uh, Liberty Dimes. Um, I even had uh, some, um, not just coins, but um, uh, paper money. Uh, I, I had some silver notes uh, as part of a collection at one point. Oh, silver certificates. Silver c- certificates, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I've got a, a couple of those. In the old days when the dollar bill or the paper coinage of the United States was could be exchanged, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I suppose if you took it to the mint in, in those days and said, "Here's this piece of paper. Give me the silver," they would actually do that. But that stopped uh, in the '60s or '50s, didn't it? I, I think it was the late '50s, early '60s. Yeah, yeah. And you know, interestingly, this isn't collecting per se. I mean, it could be considered such now because uh, they no longer mint them. But um, when I was a child, uh, my grandfather, uh, at Christmas time, uh, he would give every grandchild a silver dollar. And, uh, you know, you, you would walk away from the, the family Christmas party just feeling uh, richer in the soul and in the pocket for uh, having his silver dollar with you. Oh, you know, I have a similar memory now that you mentioned that of getting um, silver dollars and things like that uh, when I was very young. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. 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 So you're interested in coin collecting, numismatics, as the professionals say. But is there any scholarship that's been done about it outside of Greg Ruby and the fourth Garadebs? Well, we went to a resource to check, a resource that every Sherlockian should have at their fingertips. That resource is the EBSJ. In just a few keystrokes, you can find anything that has appeared between the pages of the Baker Street Journal from 1946 through 2010, all in PDF format on a single DVD. Download them to your desktop, and they're immediately available for search. Naturally, we had to search for numismatists or numismatics in the annals of the BSJ. And guess what? We came up with exactly zero articles related to that hobby. But we did find an interesting artifact. The mention of three volumes produced by A. Carson Simpson under the series called Simpson's Sherlockian Studies. Numbers 5, 6, and 7 were all about numismatics in the canon. Each of these were mentioned in sections of the Baker Street Journal in the late 1950s that summarized recent Sherlockian publications. As Holmes remarked in the retired colorman, the irregulars are useful sometimes, you know. Well, the same can be said for the EBSJ, your electronic index of the entire run of the Baker Street Journal through 2010. Get yours at bakerstreetjournal.com today. Well, you know, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was appropriate, uh, you know, difficult to, to come up with a, a gas lamp related to such a specialty such as this. And, and I, I thought, well, wouldn't it be fascinating, uh, because, because Greg talked about, uh, the, the three hours for lunch club medal. Wouldn't it be fascinating to investigate where that phrase came from, the sun's over the foreyard, and honor that in our gas lamp this time around? So, with that, that wonderful sound means gas lamp session is is in service now. And we've got the sun's over the foreyard by none other than Christopher Morley. When I was a passenger in the bark windrush, I became aware of a pleasant sea custom. Along toward noon, the captain's boy used to come politely to me and whisper, the captain's compliments and the sun's over the foreyard. And presently I learned that this meant, come aft to the poop and have a drink. For mariners, men of sound self-control, never touch the bottle until the sun reaches the yards. Now that I myself am a seaman, I always ship in square sail, never in steam. In a steamer, the yards are so much higher. Where is that from? That's lovely. Yeah. 
Um, it is from uh, one of the links in the show notes uh, on uh, fourthgaradeb.com where Greg talked about Christopher Morley and the Three Hours for Lunch Club medal. Oh, how lovely. Yeah, he's he did some research because um, he said that, uh, that Tate designed that medal and the Suns over the foreyard was uh was captioned under Morley's bowl, bowling green uh illustration and he he continued to research this online and, and discovered that the caption of the photo was slang used by naval officers to indicate that it was time for a drink and he came across a poem by the same name and was uh, pleasantly surprised Greg says to discover that Morley had written it one of the many things you can learn here at I hear of Sherlock everywhere well, and if you think you've learned anything of of import, or even export for that matter, <laughs> uh, drop us a line. Let us know what you think of the show. Let us know uh, what we can convey to Greg for being on the show. Just uh, hop on over to IHearOfSherlock.com. Send us an email at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. Uh, let us know via Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you can find us there at I Hear of Sherlock. Yes, and you can call us, 774-221-READ, 774-221-7323. We'll hear your voice. We want to hear your voice. And you can leave a review for us, too, on iTunes. Just go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash I hear of Sherlock. Love it. Love it. Well, you know, don't take any wooden nickels and um, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And, and all that good stuff. And until next time, I will never change. I will still be Scott Monty. <laughs> and I'm the rapidly changing Burt Wolder. <laughs> the, the game's game afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes.